stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here in the Hollywood Museum in the heart of Hollywood, and we're in the historic Max Factor building. Our guests today are singer Julie Garnier and author John Guzlowski. Actress, singer, voiceover artist, Julie Garnier was born and raised in Northern California, graduated from Santa Clara University with a double major, uh, and with her double major in theater and English. She got a Bachelor of Arts. She's been singing her way across America on stages in L.A., Chicago, New York, and across the ocean to London's Garrick Theater. You've seen her or heard her voice in films and TV, and she's a, a major uh, artist with symphony orchestras, too, which I think is really cool, Julie. So your forte, I guess, is cabaret. Um, uh, cabaret, concert work, but, but also theater. I do a lot of musical theater and a lot of film and television. I'm kind of across the board everywhere. <laughs> because I think symphony is uh, more difficult, it seems like. Oh, I love doing symphony work. That's my <laughs> that's my absolute favorite. If I could, if that could be my whole career. Is it I easy? Be, oh, it's well, it is for me. It's it is for me because I just I love it, and it's um, I thrive on having that many instruments behind me. But um, I mean, it's it's not easy or hard either way with just a piano or a fifty-five piece orchestra. I, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's great. It, yeah. So when you were in high school, were you singing? When did this singing career start? Oh, well, the career or the singing? The singing. <laughs> <laughs> did it lead into the career? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the singing started before I could talk. It really was oh. very early on. I, I couldn't stop listening to ABBA and... <laughs> And well, Donnie good. and Marie and <laughs> Debbie Boone and just like all the 70s, you know, Joni Mitchell, just all that 70s music I was obsessed with. Um, and then I started singing uh, those songs in front of my family. And uh, someone at my elementary school caught wind of it. And I started singing in the little plays at school there. And you then mean, when you were not even a teenager, I was like six or seven. You were. Was yeah. there music in your family? Not really. My father loved listening to music. Listening to you. <laughs> he, he loved opera. He loved Luciano Pavarotti and mm. Placido Domingo and, and all the also great classic. Um, I remember my very first memory of music is listening to The Impossible Dream. I think I was maybe two or three. Um, and it was on Reel to Reel. And it was Richard Kiley, the original oh, cast man. recording of Richard Kiley. My dad just plopped me on the floor and played this Reel to Reel that he had of The Impossible Dream. And Look. I was like, oh. Like, that was it. Richard Kiley, Man from La Mancha, right? The Man of La Mancha, yeah. And you start, you sang that then. At last summer. I was, <laughs> I was able, it was like a dream come true, and my parents came down, and uh, I got, to, uh, I got to, to star as Aldonza in Man of La Mancha last summer. That's such a great story, yeah. to start when you were six or seven like that, listening to it, and then it, being able to sing it. Yeah. <laughs> Not mid-career, maybe mid-career, right? About mid-career, I'd mid say. <laughs> <laughs> so you started in elementary school. Then in high school, what, did you do Just the did same? Just musical theater, a oh. lot of musical theater. All the time, all the time, musical theater. It's, it was my after-school activity, no sports, all musical theater all the time. So you were on yeah. the path. I was. It was clear. It, it was, was very <laughs> clear from a very early age that that's what I wanted to do with my life. And then you had this great teacher that you studied with for a long time, Edward. Oh, Sayeg? Er Edward Sayeg. I'm still with him, 22 years now. Is that right? Yeah. It's uh, very rare that you study with the same teacher for that length of time. Usually people, the, um, the turnaround rate for the least teachers is pretty high. Um, so, you know, maybe a couple of years, three years or something, but I've been with Eddie for... 
22 years and why counting. Why is that? Why is there he's a, a turnover? Genius. No, not why. Oh, why is there a turnover? Yeah, no, I know you think he's a genius. Um, uh, because there aren't a lot of geniuses out there, and, and the, the, the voice teachers that are out there teaching, um, they can usually, they usually specialize in someone who's a beginner or someone who's an intermediate or someone mm. who's advanced and they don't have the patience for beginners. Like, so you kind of want to move forward. So there's someone for each part of that career, actually. I think there, there probably Could is for be. most people, but when you find someone like Edward Sayeg, you just stay there. But does he help other people too? Oh, many, many. He's got multiple Tony winners on his roster. I mean, just incredible, incredible um, television actors, um, movie actors. And then um, what do you do? How long do you go for a session? Oh, what, it's, what do you it's, study when you go? <laughs> what, I mean, like, what is it you could do for 22 years? You must know it all by now. Uh, well, <laughs> yes, I do know it all by now. But the problem is, is that there's a couple of different things. There's, there's one that is how you sound inside your head is very different than how you sound outside your face. So you need someone with... The, the ability to guide you. So when you're singing something through, they can say, hey, this note was flat. Hey, you know, you need to, you need to lower your larynx on this section. Like there's various physical things that they have to, to be able to guide you through. And you can't do it for yourself because you sound different inside your head. But is that, do you go to them just before you're going to do a musical theater or something? Well, when I something? started, when I started, the first three years of my studies with him, I went four times a week, um, one hour a day. Wow. Um, because I knew that I wanted singing to be my career, uh -huh. and he saw potential in me, and he said, you need to come every single day, four d days a week, and really get a handle on this technique so you can just go. And so for three years, I didn't audition. I just so he gives you, you didn't audition? You didn't not, not, well, not once. Didn't audition for three years. So that was total dedication to this learning to, process. To the technique. And then what does he give you, different music? Yeah, I mean, throughout I mean, the course of it, there's a, there's a course of study called Vakai, which is the Italian method of singing, and that's a whole bunch of exercises that you can do, that we would do together. Um, and then also just, you know, factoring in also starting to learn new musical theater songs for my book so that I had a really nice repertoire so that when I did decide I wanted to move to Los Angeles and start pursuing musical theater down here or move to New York and start pursuing it there, that I had all the tools that I would need for any audition, for any concert, for any So your teacher situation. was in Northern California then? He was in Northern California. Four years into my study, he moved to Los Angeles. Oh, and that's when you came And that's down. when I came to Los <laughs> Angeles. I was like, I can't live without you. I have to move to L.A. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. Because so. I, th I think people go back and they brush up and they learn different things. Or as you said, they don't stay very long. No, and, or they switch over, like if they move to New York yeah. from Los Angeles, they find a new teacher. It happens a lot. Um, with him, I mean, I would fly, when I was living in New York full time, I would fly out here every two or three months just for a few lessons. Is that right? And then fly back. And so that's really helpful then. Very just that helpful. Little... It just puts you back on track. That's very interesting yeah. that you depend so much on something. It's like your director, I guess, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the thing about this <clears throat> career is that there's always a course of study you have to be taking. You have to be in dance class. You have to be in voice class. Mm -hmm. You have to be in acting class all the time. And you, you did it all. Rest. And you did it all? Still doing it. You're still doing it. It's never going to end. It's never going to put me end. in the ground. I'm going to be in class. You'll be in class. <laughs> so um, what was your first break? You studied for three years. That's a long time. Yeah. He, he told me, he said, there's going to be a certain point in your life that, uh, that you'll start booking um. jobs. So you need to study with me for three years. And after that point, I, I promise you, you'll start booking. So does he help you book? No. That's, no, a, that's a that's totally, totally separate totally thing. Different. Totally separate person. Totally but I mean, the idea person. that you're t studying with him, does that make open a door? It does in a way because he's so well respected. And people know his name. I mean, he's had his, he's had his name mentioned in Tony Award winning speeches as a thank you multiple times. Yeah, so, so people know who he is. So if you go in and say, I've studied with him, do you think that gives you an edge? Yes. Yes, and it's on my resume. And obviously I when think. I walk into the room, a lot of musical directors know his technique and know um, how people sound. So sometimes I'll go into an audition and I'll sing and they'll go, you study with Edward Syed, don't oh. you? Without even having my resume in front of me, because they know what his singers sound like. Is they that know right? they know his technique. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So where did you start? Well, when I moved to Los Angeles after those three years of study with him, um, I uh, my first booking out of here was the National Tour of Cats. 
That's the greatest. I Tell know. me, you played Grisabella and you played well, I started uh, Jenny, Jenny Any Nuts. Yeah, I started out as Jenny Any Dots, <laughs> and I was the Grisabella first understudy. Um, so I went on quite a bit for Grisabella. Um, it was it was wonderful. It was but a. I think she's my favorite oh, in she's all such... of theater, from opera to music, yeah. because when she sings, you just cry. You yeah. feel so sorry for her. She's a very tragic character. Yeah. <laughs> And how do you pull that out every night when you have to sing that? Um, you just, you know, it's interesting because Cats, Cats is a really interesting world. There's 28 people on stage at any given time dancing their faces off for about three hours. But as Grizabella, you're only on stage for 11 minutes. Oh, is that right? So you're backstage the whole time alone. And everyone else is on stage most of the time. So it's really, it's, I used that time alone backstage to really tap into what it felt like to be ostracized, what it felt like to be bullied in school, what it felt like to be alone so and rejected. So as I'm backstage, I'm slowly pulling up all of this rejection. But it's got to be in stages. You don't want to, like, you know, blow it all in the first act. You know, you do sing a little mini version of memory at the end of Act One, and then you do this lovely little dance. And so there needs to be a sense of vulnerability and rejection there. But then Act Two is where you really have to haul out all the big guns. To me, she's like this old cat who's looking back on her life, and she's come to the end of it. And it's so sad because she's going to die. And this is her song, and I'm like weeping. Yeah, yeah. But you also you have to remember that the song is about recalling the memory of the good times of, of the I, life. I know. Because it's, everyone keeps rejecting her. If you if you ever watch the show, every time she comes on stage, everyone's backs turn to her. They, yeah. Everyone's constantly rejecting right, her. Right. And there's this sort of um, this sort of like plea, this begging of to remind everyone, I didn't used to look like this. I, I didn't know. used to be like this. Do you remember what I once was? I was young. That's yeah. what I keep thinking. Like she's so old and they're not oh we could talk about this forever. <laughs> But you did the 2000, you, you, before we go on, when I mentioned Cats to you and Grizabella, you said, oh, yeah, I'm the sad song girl. Yeah. Tell me with, <laughs> with this laugh. I'm, just, I'm, known for, I'm just known for being sad song girl. It's really interesting. I'm really good at pulling that out. And, uh, I mean, I, every reading of a new musical, every new show that I've developed, every show that I've done pretty much, I'm, if I'm, if if I'm, an, if, I'm, if I'm a principal character, I'm usually the sad song girl. Okay, we so, got you. Now what are you doing currently? Uh, currently I'm working at uh, Disneyland's California Adventure. I'm um, playing the Queen of Arendelle and Bolda, the Queen of the Trolls, in the new Frozen Live at the Hyperion. And how long are you on? How long does that go? Uh, it's unlimited right now. We, it's an open-ended run. And so can you do other work? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I have. I mean, for example, I'm doing this concert on, on Sunday for the Actors Fund. and Which is great. Tell us a little bit about that. Where is it? Uh, it's at the Catalina Jazz Club um, on Sunday evening at 7 p.m. Um, here in Hollywood, just down, just around the corner I from know. where we are right now. Aren't we? Isn't this great? We're I right in the middle of it. I love it, it <laughs> so much. Um, yeah, and, it, you know, it's um, the Actors Fund is without a doubt my number one favorite uh, charitable organization of all time. Um, they've actually helped me in the past. Is that right? Yep. There have been times where, you know, I've been down and out and, um, I've come to wow. them in need and they have, you know, happily helped me financially. They've helped me find work. They've helped me figure out my finances. They've got a great program. Is for it people. national? It's national. It absolutely national. national. And it's, it's, a, it's the most incredible program. And it's not just for actors. It's for anyone in the business, whether you're a grip or a makeup artist oh. or a dancer. They have an incredible program for dancers. They provide shoes for dancers that can't afford shoes. That's so great. It's an incredible program. And, and, and I, so, so do they do fundraisers all the time? All the time. And I never say no. I've been doing fundraisers for them since 2003. And is that where they collect money at the end of Broadway? Or is that Broadway Help? That's, That's Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. That's a different That's thing. That's a different thing. So yeah. they don't ask for, they don't do anything at the end we, of the We theater. do a lot of concerts, oh, a, lot of, a lot of charitable benefits in those senses where you can come and enjoy dinner, enjoy music, and for your ticket price, you get this great show, but all that ticket price is going toward the Actors Be Fund and helping people in the entertainment industry. Because you're all donating your time. Correct. And that's a cabaret. Is, it, is that what they call it? Is it cabaret or not? Uh, some of them are cabaret. Some of them are concerts. I've done concerts on Broadway for the Actors Fund. Oh, you have? Yeah, absolutely. And, and here at the Catalina? Uh, here at the Catalina, it's considered a cabaret, I guess. But, and yeah. wh and what, what do you do in cabaret? 
what uh, do you get do you talk um or you sing <laughs> yes <laughs> so cabaret i mean cabaret is such an interesting word um it people are so confused by that's it that's what i'm asking yeah i you know i don't i i don't know what the definition of cabaret is um i always call them concerts it's just clearer um, for people i see um yes there is talking yes there's some funny moments yes there are sad moments um you either get one person doing an entire evening by themselves or in the oh. case of uh, the catalina on saturday uh, sorry on saturday and sunday actually um you're getting a group of people each singing individual songs so you're going to get a mix of you know musical theater pop all different kind of styles some people take the lyrics and they change them up um, some people make um, parodies out of songs, so you never know what you're going to get. Um, you just know that you you know you can start following different singers and kind of understand what their genre is. For me, most of the time, people are asking me to sing sad songs. <laughs> so you know, and we're laughing about it. Right? I know, right? <laughs> but you know, other people. You know that they're probably going to always do a 60s song because they love the, that okay. genre, or they're going to do a parody or something funny because they love that genre. So you kind of get to know who these artists are and what they live for and what they love to perform, and, and you go and see them for that. And I know you live for music. So I, I thank you so much for being with us My today. My pleasure. I think you explained so many things that people really wonder about and how you can get on that path. So I thank you. My pleasure. And don't go away, we'll be right back with author John Guzlowski. Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're taping here at the Hollywood Museum, and we're in the historic Max Factor building on Highland Avenue. Our guest, award-winning author, poet, professor, John Guzlowski was born in Germany and raised in the United States. He graduated from the University of Illinois and earned a master's and PhD in English literature at Purdue University. John taught creative writing and literature at Eastern Illinois, and he's written uh, books and poetry, basically about his family experiences. The latest is Echoes of Tattered Tongues, and he's going to talk about it today. It's published by Terry Tignasian of the Aquila Polonica, Polonica, Polonica Press. So we love Terry because she's Armenian, but she publishes books about Poland. It's a wonderful world. So here we are. Welcome. And tell us, um, you're from the East Coast. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm from, from the East Coast now. I'm originally from Chicago. Well, originally from Germany. Yeah. And then uh, I spent, uh, we moved to Chicago shortly after we arrived in the United States. And how did you get interested in English literature? Oh, it was the furthest thing from <laughs> Poland, from my parents' <laughs> Polish culture. And, right. Uh, and in fact, I was specifically interested in American literature. Uh -huh. uh, I'm, you know, growing, I grew up in a neighborhood where 95 percent of the people were around uh, sur holocaust survivors refugees uh, second generation immigrants in chicago, in chicago outside outside or in, in, the, in city? the city in the something called the uh, an area called the polish triangle right in the, oh. the heart of the city oh. and uh, a lot of my friends uh, they they drifted toward their polish uh, background and tried to enhance their polish background they went to saturday schools and where they learn learn uh, Polish culture and Polish language, and uh, it it wasn't the direction I wanted to take. I wanted to move as far from my parents and uh, and their Polish background as possible. But that was very typical of that time. Uh, it's like the immigrants' children yeah. did not want to be a part of what yeah. the immigrants were. That happened in Armenian families yeah. and and Mexican families and people yeah. always coming here forgot about it. That's why I was so interested in the ideas that your parents uh, are part of what you're writing about so yeah, much. It, it came as a surprise to me. Uh, I, was, I didn't start writing about them until the very end of my PhD career. I was doing a, uh, oh. <coughs> excuse me, I was doing a, uh, a dissertation on uh, contemporary American writers who had nothing at all to do with anything. Oh, uh, who were those writers? I was doing postmodern writers. I was doing Thomas Pynchon, John Hawkes, uh, oh. William Gaddis, and uh, John Barth were the uh, people I was focusing on. Wow. And a lot of the research I did uh, 
a lot of the academic research I did was on uh, on uh, Saul Bellow, uh, Isaac Bishop is singer. Very contemporary, yeah. right? Of, yeah. of, the, of the period. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it wasn't until I was at the very end of my uh, PhD that I sat down one day and I thought, what are my parents doing? What are they thinking about? And then I started thinking about what they were thinking about. And what I realized was that uh, you know, they were thinking about all of these terrible things that had happened to them in, uh, uh, in Germany during the war. But, but the thing was, you had that immigrant life embedded in you, mm. which probably didn't come to the surface till you started bringing it out. You were living with it, right? Yeah. I think I, I think I had to get far enough away from that before yeah. I could start coming back to it. But so many people like <clears throat> it, like the genocide, the Armenian genocide, many of those people who came here didn't want to talk about the oh, yeah, past. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I, you must have come across that as oh, well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It, for me, you know, I mentioned the conflicts between my parents. One of the central conflicts was that my, my father could not stop himself from telling me stories about the things he experienced in the camps. So he couldn't, that he, was a different kind of... Uh, he couldn't stop talking about it. So that when I was, I can't remember a time when I didn't hear my father's stories about really terrible things. I know, that's yeah. really interesting, yeah. isn't it? Because so many people suppress it. Yeah. And my mother, my mother on the other hand, my mother, if I were to ask my mother, and I did, I asked my mother, you know, to, t to tell me about to give me more information about what, what, what my father's talking about, my mother would generally, she would just wave her hand and say, you know, get out of here. You yeah, know, forget it, right? It. Yeah. And the only thing she, the only time she actually talked about uh, her experiences when I was a kid, she would say one thing over and over again. She would say, I would ask her, you know, what was it like in the camps? And she would say, I'm going to tell you one thing. <laughs> if they give you bread, you have to eat it. If they beat you, you have to run away. And it was like... But where could you run away? Where could she run? You couldn't run. No, there was no place to run. But, you know, these were the life lessons that she brought with her from the camps and that she wow. wanted to pass on. It wasn't until, it wasn't until the very end of her life that she was able to talk about the things that had happened. My father had always said, when my father would talk about my mother and her experiences, um, my father would say, I saw a terrible thing. Your mother always saw, your mother saw things that were even worse than what I saw. And she, she, he says, he would say, she doesn't want to talk about it, but you have to, you have to forgive her. You have to, you have to just um, be patient with her. There are things that she can't talk about. That's really and when she finally did start talking about these things. I mean, I understood what it was my father uh, was saying because you know what happened to her was, was just terrible. So a lot of that is in echoes of tattered yeah. tongues. Yeah. Did you enter? Is, is it a memoir or a memory? What do you call it? Uh, you know, it's uh, it was. I really enjoyed. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed writing a lot of it when I. When, it represents something like uh, 35 years of work. Uh, when I first started writing these these prose and poetry pieces that are in the book, what I was relying on specifically, uh, largely, was my father's memories. I was going to say, so it's not called a memoir, is it? What's it called? A memory, a memory yeah. unfolded. Yeah. So it's a memory of a lot of people. Did you interview other people? Well, you know, so so a lot of the stories came from my father. Right. And then after my father's death, my mother started talking. And when my mother started talking, they had a very, very conflicted relationship, the two of them. And so my mother would, you know, my mother would read a poem and she would say, oh, your father, you know, what your father told you, it's all wrong. <laughs> and she would say, this is what really happened. Oh, you mean something that you had depicted from your father's point of view. From my father's view. point of view. And yeah. then my mother's point of view. And uh, then I would give my mother's point of view. But in the book, I've, so in the book, I've got my mother's point of view, I've got my father's point of view. Uh, in some cases, I have my sister's point of view. Uh, my sister was two years older than I am. She doesn't remember the war, but she was born in 1946 in a refugee camp, and so you know she she had that more of that experience. How did they get out of the refugee camp? It was very difficult. It was my my father spent almost five years in Buchenwald concentration camp. 
and my mother spent almost three years in various labor camps. Then they spent the next six years in a refugee camp in Germany. There was there was no place they could go. So what's the refugee camp? People who came out of those working camps yes, could go and yes. be a refugee in Germany then? What, what happened was, and, and people don't know this, what people don't realize is that the Germans had to have a labor force oh. because you know, all of the men were out trying to conquer the world. When you're trying to conquer the world, you don't have time. You don't have time for your day job. Uh -huh. You have to conquer. You have to give everything to conquer the world. So there was no one to work in the factories, no one to work in the farms. Uh -huh. So what the Germans did is as they moved into Poland and as they moved into France and as they moved into Greece and Romania and Hungary and Czechoslovakia, they gathered people up. And by the end of the war, there were between 12 and 15 million slave laborers in Nazi Germany. The thing I wanted to know is your parents, I think, were Polish Catholics. Yeah, Polish Catholics. But we only hear mostly about the, the, yeah. the extinguishing of Polish mm -hmm. Jews. There were, yes, uh, and there were 3 million Polish Jews died in the war and three million Polish Catholics died in the war. It, but we never hear uh, that side well, of the story. One of the, one of the things, you know, one of the things that, one of the things that people don't talk about is just the deaths, the civilian deaths in the Second World War. 50 million civilians died in the Second World War. I taught for a long time, I taught a course on the literature of the Second World War. Oh. And when I taught that course, what I would talk about is I would talk about the great cemetery, the great graveyard of the, of the 20th century. 50 million, 50 million civilians, 20 million Russian civilians. Wow. Uh, just, uh, but, but you had asked about uh, how we came here. After six years in uh, refugee camps, and refugee right. camps were set up by the uh, United Nations. Oh, they were. And uh, the, the United Nations had the responsibility of empty, emptying the camps. And so some people were sent back to where they came from. My parents were afraid to go back. Uh, my uncle went back after spending years in a concentration camp in Germany. He went back to his hometown in Poland on a UN-sponsored train. He got off the train, he was arrested by the Soviets, and he sent him to Siberia for the rest of his life. Uh, so my, your parents made the right move. Well, my father, when he tried to go back to Poland, was shot at by the, uh, the Russian soldiers. And so he felt that they felt that they didn't want to go, go back to Poland. But there was no place to take them. And uh, the United States, I think it was in 1948, finally passed a law called the Displaced Persons Act. Oh, right. That allowed for 275,000 uh, refugees to come in. But they had to be vetted, and they also had to be, uh, you have to have someone in this country who would guarantee their passage, yeah. pay for their passage, and also uh, provide them with work for a year. And have, have that, that was that letter of recommendation that brought you <laughs> in, letter of recommendation. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's very, very interesting because I remember growing up and hearing DP, DP. Yeah, displaced person. Sure. But you never knew where they were from or what yeah. they were, yeah. what it was all about. Um, our time is almost up and this say it echoes is, say it. In, it isn't so. Say it isn't so, I know. And we didn't get to hear you read anything from Echoes of Tattered Tongues, but you have an audio book, right? Oh, yeah. I think your voice is a voice that echoes so many people who live, who are living today. And also, it really addresses the problems that we're facing yeah. as well. Yeah. So I thank you so much, thank John, you. for coming. We were at the end. Goodbye. Thank Keep you. writing to J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. <laughs>